Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to stop the bitter chatter and get ready for what matters. You know, it's Tuesday Night Fight Talk. My name is Jaya McLean. I'm a former two-time cruiserweight champion of the world. And I'm your host, and this is my show. Now let's go. What's up, everybody? This is your boy, Yaya, and welcome back. It's another episode of Tuesday Night Fight Talk. And tonight, we have my man, my brother from another mother, my rude boy. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the former WBO heavyweight champion of the world, relentless Lyman Brewster. What's up, champ? What's up, baby? I paid for that intro, man. I like that. Yes, sir. That's my man. Hey, look, you 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 earned it, bro. <laughs> hey, and you earned it. You earned it in the cold way too. <laughs> hey, you helped me remember. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, look, that's what we do, man. We've been in them trenches together for a long time, bro. Long time. A long I remember, time. I remember. I remember we used to. You remember we used to listen to Tupac when uh uh All Eyes on Me had just came out. You had that. You had that pickup truck. That was the only that was the only transportation we had. We lived in Venice Beach on the beach. Yeah, man. Hey, and you no, know, that wasn't the only transportation. Cause when we was on that beach, I used to get in your uh self-made convertible with <laughs> <laughs> Well, we gotta bring up the past, man. <laughs> hey, 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 you had a self-made convertible with, with the top didn't go on it. And I was going, and, and I was driving to the valley from Venice Beach to the valley oh, with, a yeah. blanket on, with a blanket on. Over there <laughs> <perpetrating. laughs> I forgot all about that. I, it, was a, it was a Mercury Cougar, that blue Mercury Cougar, man. Yeah, yeah I man. remember that dude. It was a '68 Mercury Cougar convert. Well, it wasn't convertible. Somebody cut the top off, and one of them crackheads out of the, in front of a. Uh, one day I was in 108th and Broadway, and uh, this crackhead came up to me and was like, "Hey, man." You want to buy a car? I said, what? He said, man, it's outside. I said, I got a convertible. I said, oh, yeah. And uh, I went outside, and I looked. I said, dad, that's, that's all right. I said, I said, how much you want for it? He was like, well, you know, man, uh, I'm trying to figure out how much. And you know, uh, the crackhead, he fiend. I said, I'll give you $50 for it. He said, here, OK, here the title. <laughs> Dude. Dude, had a three o had a three o two in it. Yeah, man. Yeah, hey. I, I I bought it for fifty bucks on on a hundred eighth and Broadway, man. Hey, and I used to roll that joint. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the truck, but I used to roll that joint. <laughs> word, word. Hey, boy, we, we had some wild good times back then, boy. Yeah, yeah, man. That's what it was all about, man. You know, I wouldn't trade. You know, I always, I always say, you know, when I when I become an old man, because I feel like I'm an old man, because, you know, I just don't have the desires that I used to have. You know, right. I just, you know, I look back in my life, man, and it's like, you know, I'm thankful for everything I went through. It helped me to, to be one of them people that don't be 50 up in the club. You know what I mean? Because I did everything I wanted to do in my life. You feel right. me? Yep, yep, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, I was there for a great part of it, so I enjoyed it with you, bro. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All the way. You know what I mean? All the way, dude. Real I, talk. I, I can tell you one part that I didn't enjoy. Well, before What's that? We did that, that was that that when we used to be out there with Willie Gault. And, <laughs> <laughs> I already that, know. Man, that running, y'all used to be out there running hard. I ain't never been fast. Trying to stay with that fool, man. So let's jump into it, man. Let's just go ahead and, and, and talk boxing. Let's go all the way back to the amateurs. Let's yep. go to the amateurs. Now, who was that one cat that you had to keep seeing? Sometimes, the amateurs? Sometimes he went. Uh, Everybody got one. You know what, man? Um, it was it was three dudes that come to mind when you say that. Uh, one dude was a Mexican dude by the name of Juan Cruz, man, out of San Diego. This dude was like Muhammad Ali, man. Like he didn't look it. Like he 
he he he he was built like a like a chubby dude, but he was so light on his feet, man. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I kept seeing him. You know what I mean? Um, another dude was uh, Devaro Williamson, Touch of Sleep. Yeah. And then the the last dude who beat me to go to the Olympics, but that was because I was going through a divorce. Let's just put that on out there. <laughs> uh, that was Nate the Snake. <laughs> that was Nate Jones. <laughs> oh you know man! I mean? You like, beat Nate. You meet. You beat I Nate. Beat Nate. I fought Nate. I fought Nate. Uh, one, two, three, four, five times. I fought him once as a pro, four times as an amateur. I beat him every time except one. And that was when it came to going, like, in the Olympic trials, I was already number one in the United States. He was always behind me. He was number two. And I had always beat Nate. But that time, me and my ex-wife had gotten a big argument right before it was time to get in the ring. And then the crazy part about it, man, was... So I wanted her to come see me because I'm in the finals, right? You know what I mean? I'm in the Olympic trials. And she knew that was my dream. Right. So she was like, nah, I ain't coming, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, dad, OK, I supported you your career. I want you to support me mine. So anyway, right. I put it out of my head. I'm going to go. And, and I'm going to go. And, and I'm going to live my dream, which was to go to the Olympics and to be a world boxing champion professional. Right. So as I go downstairs to get in the in the vehicle, I'm sitting in the back with our trainer, Bill Sladen, rest in peace. Right. And that's when he gave me the name Relentless. Matter of fact, when we got to, uh, when we first got there, uh, and it just stuck. So anyway, we get in the van, Floyd, all these dudes, man, they all in the car. We driving over to the venue. The venue is about two blocks away. We put all the luggage in the back, all the, all the, you know, the head gear, just everything you take to the venue. And we driving down the street. They say, turn on the radio. And because my wife was an actress, they just announced that she had just flown, had just landed in Oakland and was going to the mall down the street from where I was about to fight. Now she hadn't even told me that. So what? I was so distraught because, you know, what I mean? I'm, what, 23? You know what I mean? And, and my mind was like this. I'm number one in the United States. I'm number two in the world behind Felix Savan. I'm about to murder this dude. I didn't already beat this dude. You know what I mean? So my what? mind was like, look, you don't fault this dude umpteen times. This ain't nothing new. You in shape, but you angry. Go in there and take your anger out on this dude because I don't need to think. I just need to fight because this is what I felt like doing because I'm the man. You know what I mean? I'm stuck on myself. So I get in the ring with this dude and all I saw was red because I'm like, man, I'm angry. because. And then I really want to take it out on him because he is from Chicago. You know what I mean? I'm from Indianapolis. You know what I mean? Like, like he was, he, he, yeah. So, you know, it was, it was always this, this, you know, when you were a kid, man, by association, the neighborhood I grew up in, right. the neighborhood he grew up in, he from Chicago, I'm from Indiana. Yeah, let's do this. So right. I'm I'm waiting for the bell to ring, but he was thinking about bigger things. He was thinking about actually fighting smart. And smart ain't always because you in shape and you angry and you can you didn't beat everybody. You know what I mean? So right. I went out there playing checkers. He went out there playing chess. All right, yeah. bell ring. I go out, I'm blaming Brewster. I'm swinging at this dude. I'm trying to knock him into 2020. You hear me? Right, I'm trying right. to knock him into the pandemic in 95. Well, it actually was 96. <laughs> so he was smart enough because he's slick. That's why they call him Nate the Snake. He's slick, right. you know what I mean? He's yeah, slipping, yeah, he's slick. touching me. Yeah, he touching me. And then after he touched me, he get on his bicycle and you know, my mind, I'm I'm so I'm so angry that it ain't into the third round when I, I let go of all that emotion. I'm like, dog, you losing this fight. And shoot, yeah. man, the next thing I know, here I am trying to, you know, put my hands up and be like an amateur boxer versus the professional style that I was taught and I was murdering boys with in the gym and every time I fought. But at this point, man, he had, he was up so so much on point that you know, I couldn't well, recover by the time my, my sense got common to me, you feel me? 
Yeah. So he won. He went to the Olympics, but you know, that was a lesson learned, man. It was it was a true yeah. lesson learned. You know, don't don't never allow your emotions to get in the way of your business, your work, whatever that is you got to do. So I learned to separate it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so the ex-wife that he mentioned is Tashina Arnold from Martin, and she's a cool person. I mean, y'all yeah. went through what y'all went through, but she's we was young, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were young. And, and everybody go through things, man. So Absolutely. it is what it is, man. We both grew. Like, she grew, I grew, man. Like, she, you know, that's my girl. She, we're, we're, we're friends, you know what I mean? And, right. and you know, we, that was a, I was in my 20s. I was 23, got married when I was 19, you feel me? So yeah. I was a baby. She was a baby, you know what I mean? But now... You're married, and you've been married for how long now? I've been married since Vietnam, Jack. <laughs> no. So, so this year we'll make 20 years. It'll be 20, 20 years August on um, October 6th that we've been married. We've been together for 23, but you know, it's been uh been 20 years, man. Like wow. they don't even, you know, seem like yesterday. Hey, man, congrats to you, bro, cause. You know, I've been married five times. You could put all five of them times together and you don't come nowhere <laughs> close to no 20 nothing. <laughs> well, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is I'm glad they ain't teardrops. They be on your knees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, okay, so let's go. Let's fast forward now. You, you didn't make it to the Olympics. Right. Turn pro. And you on a tear. You whooping everybody. You knocking everything out. Yeah. How do you end up with the uh, creator of The Simpsons? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm blessed and highly favored. Let's get that on out the way. You know what okay. I mean? Like, it ain't never been for no other reason than God has just shown me favor in my life, man. And so I met Wildcard Boxing Gym one day training. And, uh, you know, Freddie Roach, is, is, he's family. And uh, <clears throat> I said to Freddie one day, I said, listen, man, uh, I don't have my, and see, it's crazy. I don't know if you knew that, but my first manager was my amateur manager by the name of Ed Weinberger, who created the Cosby show. You know what I mean? Oh, like wow. he, he was, yeah, you know what I mean? Like he was the man. But the point is we went our separate ways and I was in the gym. And I was telling Freddie, like, listen, man, um, I'm looking for another manager. And I said, if you if you can advise, if you can maybe, you know, give me some advice, or if you know anybody, let me know. So one day I'm I'm over, I'm over on a heavy bag and I'm hitting the bag, and um some dude comes up to me while I'm while I'm working the bag and he talking to me and I'm looking at this dude like, man, don't you see me working out? Like, you know what I mean? Like you couldn't wait till the bell rung or something. Right. And you know, I didn't make no big deal of it. You know, he was just like, well, you know, Freddie said you was looking for a manager. Like he never said anything about who he was. Cause that's the way Sam was. He was just a down to earth dude, man. Like, right. like Sam dressed worse than me. Only, only thing you, only thing about Sam is that he might have a watch on that costs more than the city. If you're a watch man, then you right. would know. If not, you know what I mean? You'd be like, this dude a bum. Right. So, lo and behold, man, uh, he, you know, he said, you know, let's, let's talk. You know, Freddie said, if you were looking for a manager or whatnot, and, uh, you know, shoot, man, it just, it just really went from there, man. You know, we, we became family, you know, rest so in peace, man. He was a great guy. And so your your first manager was from the what you say the, the Cosby Show, right? Yeah, Ed Weinberger. If you look right. on the credit, like he yeah, did, Ed like Weinberger. Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah, he all did that. a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, man, he was and great. Then, he's still he's still around. He's a great guy. And then you get your new manager, the creator of The Simpsons, Sam Simon. Yeah. 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 Boy, that's all right. That is all. Good. Yeah. So, so from good. there, good let's let's talk about this career of yours. From there, what happened? How the ball get rolling? Well, you know, man. Um, shoot, I just 
I fought my way up. You know, I, I fought on uh, Cedric Kushner's uh, heavyweight explosions. Uh, you know, remember Willie Goat used to be my, he was my, he was my amateur, uh, well, not amateur. He, when I turned pro, Willie Goat had managed me. Uh, you know, he was the receiver for the Chicago Bears back when they had Jim McMahon and, right. you know, Dick Buckus and, you know, when, when they was the Bears. And so he had me up until about 10 fights. Was that? I think it was the 84 Bears. Yeah, it was 84. Yeah, I think it was. So, yeah, man, you know, he 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 was by my side, you know, used to have me out there running Santa Monica College, UCLA track, you know what I mean? Helped yep. me to help me to develop explosiveness because I never I never understood what 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 the real benefit of what sprints was what could be for a fighter. And yep. so um I was with him for a while and 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 like I said, then when I started going up the ladder, he couldn't really take me where I needed to go. And so that's when uh, I was introduced to uh, Sam Simon. But like I said, I was with uh, Cedric Kushner and ended up getting with uh, Bob Arum. And then uh, after I had my loss, so I had two losses. And uh, I lost to um, Cliff ATN and uh, I tore my ACL. And as a result of, of having my, tearing my ACL, I was put on bed rest so I wouldn't have surgery and I gained a whole lot of weight. And then in trying to lose weight, instead of asking other professionals in the sport of boxing, I asked weightlifters how to get weight off. And you know, just not having not having knowledge at that time about eating, because when you're young, when you're from the hood, you run and you eat, and it don't matter what you eat, you know what I mean? So for me. I was just eating whatever, but I had gained so much weight, and then I ended up dropping this weight, and uh, I ended up losing to a dude named Charles Shuford because I had dropped so much weight, I was weak in the fight, and after that, uh, Aram dropped me, rightfully so, and then I, I went to Don. I Mark. was in Cobo Hall losing my mind at that fight. Dude, hey man, you know what? That dude, and listen, I don't mean this in a negative way, but I'm saying, if that dude wouldn't have been so afraid of me, he could have stopped me because I was so weak that I couldn't even, like, that's the only time in my life I had to talk to myself about what I was going to do because I was so tired from the time I threw one punch. All right, pick your foot up. Ready? Go. All right. Throw the jab. Ready? Huh? I was so, I, I didn't understand it. I was yelling at you like, yo, what are you doing? Throw something, man. What, I, just I, I can't even tell. A, a man that possessed the power that you possess. Yeah. But I, I came down for 300. I was 305 pounds. I came down from 305 pounds to 225 pounds in three months. Mm. I lost so much weight. But see, what they told me, and I said they, meaning the weightlifters told me at the time. Now, mind you, I'm young, man. So young and dumb. So they were telling me, don't eat no carbs. And then when they explained to me what carbs was, but I could still eat meat, my mind was like, oh, okay. Cause I thought, you know, you got your energy from meat. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't understand protein versus carbohydrates. So all through, all through that whole training, I'm not eating no carbs based on what they telling me, rice, you know, just any type of carbohydrate I'm not eating. I'm just eating meat and vegetables. And I'm wondering, like, man, why am I so freaking tired? And I'm like, I'm eating, I'm drinking, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm sleeping. But I didn't know that the carbs gave, gave you fuel. So I said, well, when I get there and I'm, I, I can, like, and I mind you, I was so used to trying to make weight for fights from coming up as an amateur in my okay. mind as a professional. I always wanted to weigh as less as I could because in my mind, my mind said, this is where you got to be in order to be successful. So you got to reach this point. So I got my weight down to, I believe it was 224 from 310 pounds in, in less than three months because I ran so much, man. And I, I knew I was going to make me tired, but I said, well, I'm going to have a week. I'm going to have a week of the fight to rest up. And so I was more worried about, because see, first of all, I sparred with Shuford. I sparred with him when Michael Dokes uh, used to used to have me out in Vegas working with yeah. me for Bill. And so I knew I could beat this dude. He knew I could beat him too. 
Yes, I I didn't I didn't underestimate him. That it, it it wasn't about him. It was about me. And I'm like, look, man, you got to come in there right. So you got to come in there on weight. You got to look good. Everything looked good. I got my weight down, but I didn't know that it would take away from my strength, and it did. So you know, more power to him, man. I I I don't have. I mean, yeah, listen, I'm always gonna have that black guy. You know what I mean? But yeah. but I say to myself, he know and I know. If things were right, he know who would have won that fight. But, you know, he won it, man, made the best man win. He was a better man what, that night. I tell you what, what y'all should do. Because you can draw, right? Absolutely. Think y'all need to have a contest. What you mean, a drawing contest? Yeah, shoot for draw, too. What do you mean? He draws. Oh, for real? Yeah. Well, see, he pro he'll probably be better than me because... I don't draw like I used to, you know what I mean? So I don't know, man. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm old draws. now. He draws. Oh, is that? Yeah. yeah, he's a good dude, man. I, I ain't never got nothing negative to say about that brother. He's he's a good dude. We ain't never, we always been friends, and I, I still consider him friends, you know? Just, he was a better man that night. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, you know, we came up together in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, okay. I had nightmares after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, boy. Uh, I was born. Anyway, so let's keep going, man. All right. All right. So, so after that fight, how do you come back from that? Well, it's interesting because that was when Bob Burham let me go because they like, man, you lost to Charles Shuford. And I was even to the point where I was like, well, Dag, I lost to Charles Shuford. Maybe I don't need to fight no more. And so uh, I'm trying to think. Somebody said, man, you should go over to Don King. And I was like, man, I'm not trying to go to Don King. All the horror stories that I heard. But, you know, at this point, I'm in California. I'm there to be I, I a fighter. I was one of them. I was one of them. Right, right. Well, right, right, right. This is true. This is true. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the, the thing is, I said, well, I don't have nothing to lose. You know, I was with Cedric, Cedric Kushner. I was with Bob Ram. And, and here's the thing about Don. And everybody know this. Back then, I don't know about now, but back then, Don pretty much controlled the heavyweight division. If you want to be a champion, Don can get you a title shot. But you know, it's like it's like it's like making a uh, making a pat with the devil. He gonna get something from you, so he gonna get you the title, but he gonna get your money. You know what I mean? Right. And he's just a great businessman. You know, I was I was. I used to be angry with Don because I'm like, look, man, I'm a, I'm a kid from the hood. You know, I ain't never had nothing. And instead of doing something negative in life, I'm out there trying to do something positive. This man has a billion dollars. Why would he not try to help me to be financially set as well? You feel me? And so with that being said, man, I went on over to Don and Don was like, look, you didn't come to me in the beginning when I tried to get you right out of the amateur. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put you at the bottom of my list of all my fighters. Now, you got to fight your way up to the top. And if you fight your way up to the top, then I'll get you a title shot. So I said, hey, man, you know what? I ain't got nothing to lose because right now I'm, I'm ready to hang it up, maybe go to the streets, you know what I mean, back to the streets or something. So he threw everybody he could at me. I knocked out everybody he had, including Nate Jones. And shoot, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, the reason why I say that, because the first title I ever fought for as a professional was against the dude that beat me to go to the Olympics, man. Right. And, and so that, that fight meant more to me than, than any professional fight I had had until I won my title because Nate Jones was the dude that kept me from going to the Olympics, man. And, and because of that, it made me a better me. You know what I mean? At the end of the day. So shout out to Nate Jones, my brother, number love. Yeah, but, um, yeah man. So, you know, I, I beat everybody that Don had. And uh, when I got to that number one spot, it came down. Um, Sam Simon had flown me and him down to the WBC convention, which was in Miami, Florida that year. And so that's, that's around the time I, I had told you don't oh go ahead, go ahead, never mind. 
All right, all right, all right. So, so, so there you go. There you go. So uh, I went down here, and I was number I was number four in the world because I had just already beat Nate Jones, and I wanted to fight for the title. So the number one and the num the, the the number one spot had became available, and I was deemed number one because uh, Nate Jones. I had just beat Nate, so they moved me from number four to number one after I beat Nate Jones. I might say that backwards, but anyway, the point is this. When they when they went to have the roll call for that that number one spot, you know, I said, "Here I am, I'm present." So instead of them giving me the title, because remember, Corey Sanders had beat Vladimir Klitschko a year before. Mm -hmm. But see, uh, what what ended up happening, Corey Sanders was my mandatory to fight. Corey Sanders gave up his belt because he didn't want to fight me. So he went and fought with uh, Vitaly Klitschko, Vladimir's brother. And yeah. I ain't mad at him because it was more money. And plus, right. he was going to get stretched. But anyway, the point is this. Oh, wait, they he was going to get stretched by who? Layman Brewster. Remember, <laughs> Layman Brewster, he was going to get stretched. You act like you know. So anyway, um, he gave up his title because he didn't want to fight me. So then instead of the WBO just giving me the belt, they said, well, you got to fight somebody for the belt. I'm like, well, hold on. I'm number one. I beat everybody in the top 10. And as a matter of fact, and I still got the letters to show the people that I even offered to fight me that wouldn't fight me. And I ain't even going to say it was even people that had titles, but I ain't going to get into that right now. The point I'm making is this. I was Bye. number Call one. Them suckers out, man. Call them suckers out, man. Call man, them we old. out. Look, look, I'm old. I'm ready to be taken out with the trash now, man. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm stale now, man. <laughs> Hey, look, I can't even win in a boxing game on PlayStation, so you know I ain't trying to get. It. But, but, but so what ended up happening was this: Don King, being a businessman that he is, he said, "Well, Brewster's number one. What I'm going to do, I'm going to see if I can get uh, Vladimir Klitschko." So the WBO sends me a letter and says for a whole, for, well, they didn't say for a year. They just said, you can't fight until we give you that title fight that you're now number one for. Well, the whole time they letting Vladimir Klitschko fight every three months on HBO. And I'm sitting there like, hold on, man, I'm number one. This dude ain't even got a title. He ain't even in, like, in, I think he moved him to like number five. But I'm like, well, hold on, man. Why you just won't give me the title? Or won't you let me fight who's number two for the title? So every three months, his rank is moving up, moving up, moving up. And then at the end, Don King flies him and Vitaly Klitschko to his house and, and say to Vladimir, hey, listen, you know, Lehman Bruce is number one. And he's my fighter. If you just sign with me, I'll give you the title. You ain't even got to fight for it. So Vladimir said no. So he said, well, okay, you're going to have to fight Lehman Brewster. And to make a long story short, he fought Lehman Brewster. Последние секунды Брюстеру повезло, повезло. Что, что, что случилось? Чемпионом мира по версии WBO побеждает техническим нокаутом Владимира Кличко в пятом раунде. Эй, man, that fight was so that fight was like a real life Rocky. It was, man. And you know the thing about it is. They never, they never show that fight uh, like, like how they would show fights in the past. Right. And you know, I'm just wondering, like, man, that's one of the best fights 
th that anybody like not because it was me but dude it was it was one of the best fights and it was a masterpiece because I never went into the fight with the hopes on winning any round I went in with the with, with only one thought get this man into the deep water and you know from being a champion and being a fighter yourself when you get into the late rounds your skills don't matter no more your conditioning don't matter no more only thing matters is how much do you want it and that's where I wanted to get him because I felt like mentally after watching a couple of fights that he had, even though he won, he was so tired. I said to myself, I want to see what he would do when he get to a point where we both tired, his skills and whatever he took to give him that strength don't matter no more. Let me see how big his balls are. And so that's where in my mind, I said, I'm going to get him. You know, they say pressure, uh, pressure bust pipes. And so what I wanted to do was show him what, what, how diamonds form under pressure. You know what I mean? Because I've been I've been forced in steel because I grew up in a hood. I grew up in pressure. You know what I mean? I, I, I grew up with, with bullets flying past my head, with my boys getting killed. I mean, man, I, I, I didn't everything that, that I projected in that fight was a win-win situation for my life. And I wanted to see how much his life meant to him versus that title. Because like I told him, you're gonna have to kill me to win. And I just I stood on that. I was ready to die. So hey. the fact that he he wasn't ready to die. I became champ. Hey, and, and you, boy, I'm talking about. He tried too. He tried. Yeah, he tried. He, he had, could punch, he man. Had He's you a big, down, strong had dude. You, hurt. you got up. I'm talking about, man. You got up, and everything that we used to talk about back in the day, everything we used to talk about, we'd be running. We used to see everybody that's doing it. All the dreams and hopes and aspirations, I could see it in your face when you came. In that, that last round, and when you crack that boy, when you crack that joker, man, whoo! And then the how you the, you, you you really prove your name because you did not stop. You was dead tired and relentlessly closed the show and won the title. Well, man, that was beautiful. That was a real life rocket story, though. Well, you know, man. Like I said, I give, I give props to to all y'all, man. You. Uh, Montel, uh, James, Tony, I mean, just a lot of people who, who inspired, was a good inspiration for me, man. Like you, you ran with me, you pushed me when I was down. You never let me get down. You know what I mean? So I feel like my success ain't my success. It's our success. You feel me at the end of the day. And, and so, you know, man, for, for me, what I try to do now in life is, is take that platform as a champion but because really a champion is a mentality. You know what I mean? You don't need somebody to tell you you're a champion. A champion is how you feel about yourself. Yep. You know, that's the difference between the cute girl and the, the cute girl in the club that, that just knows she fine versus the ugly girl in the corner that knows she fine. You know what I mean? You attracted to the ugly girl over the cute girl. You know what I mean? Just because of the confidence that they exude with themselves. But, but that's the way that, that we have to be as champions in life. You got to believe in yourself if nobody believe in you, man. You know, I was growing up in the hood. I remember Cash, you'd be like, oh, little nigga, you don't get knocked out. Okay. That just made me train harder. That just made me say, you know what? I ain't doing four rounds. I'm doing five rounds. I ain't doing five rounds. I'm doing six mm -hmm. rounds. And it just made me motivated by everybody who told me what I couldn't do or what I wasn't going to be. Now and all of them asking me for money. Oh, yeah, I knew you was going to make Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, whatever. right, right. Man, so let's talk about the, the other fight where it was it was just crazy. I mean, I, I believe you even said it before where you said that was the one time that you uh, actually wanted to kill somebody <laughs> when you fought Galata. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so what, was, did, a... what did Galata do before the fight Cause I didn't see nothing that he did that was so bad that made you want to kill the brother. All right. Well, I'm glad that you asked me that question. So you put yourself into my shoes. So I had I was coming off of fighting Kali Mihan, who was my first uh, my first title defense. I didn't right. fight good against Kali Mihan because I had too much feeling involved. I, Kali helped me get ready for Klitschko. So in my mind, they like, well, who you want to fight? But you got to fight 
since you won this title, you got to defend your title within the next four months. I'm like, but dad, I ain't even had time to realize that I had a title. So right. they was like, well, we're going to give you a list of people. So I wasn't looking for an easy fight. I was just looking for a fight that, that I felt like, okay, I can show who I am. So I picked Kali Mihan. Kali Mihan helped me so much on every level to get ready for Vladimir. And I thought to myself, well, it would be a good paycheck for him and a good win for me. You know what I mean? Right. So when the, fight, when the fight started, man, I didn't leave my emotions in the locker room. You feel me? Because I remember even you wanted to fight me after that fight. Everybody wanted to fight me because y'all know I didn't fight my fight. So to make a long story short, after I barely won the fight, which I won, Don was like, you got to redeem yourself, man. Everybody think you soft now. And I'm like, yeah, you right. So he was like, well, look, won't you fight Andrew Galata? And uh, he was like, well, you know, remember what he did to Bo? And he's tough and blah, blah, blah. You know, Don, he, he's a great convincer. Great and so I said, you know what, man? All right, I'll take that fight. But here's the catch. And this is what got me angry. The fight was not supposed to be in Chicago. Hmm. Chicago has the largest Polish population in the world outside of Poland. And Andrew Galata is a Polish guy, went to the Olympics, so he's all Polish. Right. So, of course, they're going to support. So, so then they make the fight in Chicago. That makes me angry because now I can't change. Then they don't let me change the size of the ring. They get this big old ring. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a come get you type of guy. I don't need you to be able to run to Africa. You feel me? So right. I wanted a small ring. They give, they give us the biggest ring. So they had a I ring. They had a ring built for me. Right, right. A boxer. You feel me? <laughs> so, so, so then on top of that, I find out the week when I get there that the referee of the fight was Galata's trainer's best friend. Mm. And they said, and they said he was the worst referee in the state of Illinois. You hear me? Like they they was telling me about all the devious stuff. And they like, well, he's going to be your referee. I'm like, well, hold on. So you know, as a champion, you get to veto somebody out of the out of the the, the circuit, whether it's a judge, whether it's a referee. Yeah. So I try to use my my power as a world champion to say, listen, replace this dude. They go out of their way to tell me no. So not only can I get a smaller ring, now I got to fight against the dude who's friends with the guy I'm about to fight. So then when, when that, that morning, the day before the fight, they, they call us over to uh, this radio station in the morning. And they say, uh, well, we're, you have to do a satellite interview because this fight is going to be shown around the whole world. So I'm like, all right, cool. What time? They say six. Well, in LA, it's three hours different. So I come there six in the morning, three in the morning in LA. And I'm like, well, hold on, man. I get there. We get this little bitty room, man. I mean, dude, this room is so little that, that barely two people can fit in it. So they say, your camp's got to stay outside. So me and him go in, just me and him. And then the guy that is uh, conducting mm -hmm. the interview and so it's early in the morning. I got my hood on my head. I'm slumped. I'm tired, man. You know, I'm still trying to rest because I didn't, you know, I'm, I didn't came out of camp. I'm on a different time zone. It's early in the morning. So the, the, the gentleman says, well, I'm going to start the interview. He said, the first question I want to ask is to Andrew Galata. Mr. Andrew Galata, this is your hometown. What are you going to do? Now, mind you, Andrew Galata wasn't my mandatory. I didn't have to give this dude. I gave this dude the chance to fight me because I wanted to be able to show what I could really do. Like it, like the fight, the fight with Vladimir wasn't a fluke. You know what I mean? Right. So he he jumps up, stands up, and he's standing over me like he was gonna hit me. I'm like, huh? He said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, I'm going to, and he started talking about what he was going to do to me. Like he was going to scare me. Like, nigga, I'm from the hood. You better be glad I ain't got my pistol. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, don't you, don't get it twisted. You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm not that type of dude. I don't do all that talk. That's why 
when I was fighting, you never heard me talk because if I said I'm gonna do something to you, that's because I got handcuffs and I already did it. You feel me? That's the way I grew up. I don't do all that talking. If you're gonna do something, do it. You know what I mean? Then talk afterwards. So, like I said, he's standing over me. It's early in the morning. I'm sitting down like, is this dude finna hit me? Like, you know, if you hit me, it ain't gonna be no fight, right? You know what? You're not my mandatory. So now you already got three strikes against you. But me being Lehman Brewster, I'm such a nice guy. So anyway, <laughs> we get to the fight the next day. We get to the fight the next day. I'm in the locker room. And as I'm in the locker room, it's time to go out, right? So as I'm walking out of the locker room, I'm in, I, I'm standing at, you know, how they, they start the music when you get to the, to the, to the tunnel, right. to the end of the tunnel where you're about wall. to walk out. Right. So I got my guys around me, you know, and I'm warming up and they just started the music. I noticed it's like raining. I'm like, well, dad, we indoors. I look up, it's people standing over the tunnel spitting off of the tunnel right and i in my life in my life in every movie i ever watched in every fight i've ever went to i've never seen nobody getting spit on and so as i'm walking down the aisle my guys had to surround me because they're spitting on me you feel me right. and then all i'm seeing is these polish flags and then i'm thinking about what this cat talking about what he gonna do to me and like hold on man so when I got to the ring, at this point, I don't even care about fighting no more. I'm ready to kill, you feel me? Because I ain't never had nobody spitting on me, you feel me? That's one of the most undignitary, indignitary, just, just, that's one of the worst things. You, I'd rather you hit me, I'd rather you slap me than to spit on me, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so when I got into the ring, I'm so angry at this point, I'm I'm shaking. Like if you if you go back and watch the fight when I get in the ring, I'm not even I'm not even in the I'm like like I'm not even shadow boxing. I'm kind of like trembling because at this point I'm just I'm ready to just murder. I don't even care about winning. I just want him to die. Even if that meant I lose, as long as he died, that's all that mattered. So when the bell rang, all I did was do what any cat would do. They want to kill somebody. Like if if, if I could have broke my wrist off so that my my bone, this this bone, if I could have made it go through my glove, I don't care how much pain it would have been, if it would have went through the glove to kill him, that's what I wanted to do, man. So, you know, I just took it out on him, man. You know, and it was his it was it was his mouth that wrote a check that he couldn't cash. It was it was his fans that that they didn't understand. You don't make a nigga from the ghetto that angry that can fight. And and then, you know, the, the, the fifth mistake that he made was he tried to stand there in front of me. That No, you're not going to do that. Ain't no man finna stand in front of me toe to toe. And the only reason why ATN did it is because I tore my ACL and I still fall for 10 rounds on one leg. So that's what it is. You so, know? so 55 seconds into the fight, in Chicago, his second hometown, in front of all the Polish people, you took it all out and broke a record, put you in the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest knockout in a heavyweight championship fight. Hey man, he did it to himself. You know what I mean? If he if he would have presented himself like a gentleman, you know, boxing is a is is a professional sport, man. If he was like you know. If he would have presented himself like a gentleman, you wouldn't have knocked him out in the first round. You didn't knock him out in the second round. <laughs> exactly. But in the words of Don King, his his chances were slim to none, and Slim was out of town. Slim was out of town. Real talk. Oh man. So you know, man. You know, it it was just one of them things, man. It, it was the perfect combination because. That was a fight that that I I trained I trained very hard for man. I mean there were some things that led up to that. Like for instance, what I what I failed to mention also, my house got broken into. You know what I mean? Because come to find out, it was my neighbors that lived behind me. 
they they saw me on TV advertising, getting ready for a fight. They knew my wife was pregnant and she had a pattern taking my kids to school. They waited till she took them to school to break in the crib, but she decided instead of after, after dropping them off, like she would normally do, go to the gym, she came back home, they in my house. So, yeah. you know, I told God, I said, listen, if you don't let me win this fight with Galata, I'm gonna kill those dudes. I didn't care about going to prison. You know what I mean? Like, of course I cared about going to prison, but they was going to die. You know what I mean? So God bless me. And that's why I'm so like I am, man, because I know God is real. Because, dude, my life, man, like I said, if I wouldn't have won that Galata fight, them dudes would have been dead. They really would have. Yeah. Yeah, man. You, you crazy, man. You are crazy, man. Whatever that definition is, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a real dude, man. You know me. Shoot, I'm I'm just I like to have fun. I like to laugh. You oh, know, yeah. I just I just yeah. But I ain't never gonna let nobody do the things that, that Galata tried to do. You know what I mean? Like like as a man, you know, we I'm in this I'm in this sport to be the best that I can, but but you know, I got done wrong, man. I, they did me wrong, and, and that, that wasn't cool, man. And I didn't make a lot of money for that fight. After I just knocked out Vladimir, after I had just won a, a title defense, I still got peanuts. So, of course, I had every every reason to be mad. Yeah. And the words of the public in me, you're kind of hostile. <laughs> hey, man, but I'm still kind of hostile about one thing about you, because I feel like you never reach your full potential. And part of the reason is because you didn't use that jab like you're supposed to. You got one of the hardest jabs I ever been hit with. That one time you hit me. And I said you would never hit me again with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? I, I, I agree with you, y'all. You know, I, I definitely agree. I didn't I didn't reach my full potential, man. Um the thing thing the thing of it is, man, um, it's, it's I was so good. Yeah, it was circumstances, man. Like there was, there was a lot of people that thought that I should use my right hand a lot more, but I never. I always used my right hand when it was necessary. So, but but what happened was people start one because he had to build that. People didn't know my style. All they knew was that I was tough and I could punch. They didn't know I had skills. They didn't know my speed. They didn't know anything about me other than oh, he can punch. And so when I brought people in to work with me because I was so young minded, you know, not, not being a man and fully understanding that I am the boss. I act like they were the boss and what right. they said, I tried to do to make them happy. Whereas I just didn't know, you know what I mean? Because I, I came to California when I was 18, you know, Bill Slayton became my father. He became my trainer and then he passed away. So I was just like a puppy looking for somebody to just rub me, you know what I mean? And take me in. So, really anything somebody said, oh, okay, well, maybe you're right. Well, I've been boxing since I was seven, since 1980. I already knew everything. I was like like the last dragon. I already knew everything. There's nothing nobody in this sport could have taught me except for me to believe in myself. All you had to do was teach me to believe in myself, and I probably still have my, I know I still have my title because of my speed, my power, my skills. Not just, I wasn't just a big man. I was a skilled man to be big, which, which is very rare to be able to box with people like yourself, a master boxer, and to, and to be able to just be in a ring with a dude like you, Montel, and other dudes, James Tony, that has so much skill. It just sharpened me and started being in there with, like Muhammad Ali referred to him as dinosaurs. I was in there with dudes like yourself that was all about playing that chess game, playing that chess game. That's why I kicked your butt in chess a couple of times. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, as soon as we get finished with this call, we can get on the on the on the app and see what's really happening. Nah, man, because I like the way your beard look now. And if I beat you again, it might all be great, Nick. <laughs> hey man, you crazy, man. So man, let me ask you this, man. Let me ask you a couple more questions. What was the high point of your career? Huh? That's a good question, man. Okay, okay. So the high point of my career, I would say 
naturally winning the world heavyweight title. Right. Why, why do I say that? My explanation of my, my why is because since I was a kid, I prayed to God to allow me to be a world champion. And as I became a heavyweight at 18, I asked him to allow me to become a heavyweight champion. So imagine a dude that started at the age of seven. I didn't win a world title until I was 31. So imagine from seven to 31, praying to God every day to let you become a world champion. Now yeah. you wake up with the title in your hand. It was to the point, and like I said, because they didn't give me enough time to even enjoy being a champion, because I had to go right back into camp after beating Vladimir. Do you know for about eight months to a year after I won the title, when I got on my knees to pray, I still would say, God, so, 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 let me be heavyweight. Oh, thank you, Father. I am heavyweight champion. Because <laughs> I, I, just, I said it for so, it, it was so, it was so rep, rep, repetitious for me to say day after day, year after year, decade after decade, let me be a world champion in my prayer that it took me eight to eight months to a year to stop saying it. You know what I mean? Like I was yeah. in the middle of my prayer. Oh, I mean, thank you, Father. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. But my highlight, man, I, I don't know, man. My because because see the thing is, I just wanted to be able to say I was a world champion. I didn't get into boxing to, to be rich. I didn't get in boxing to be famous. I just wanted to be heavyweight champion of the world, man, because that's the one thing that that how many people on the face of this earth out of all the billions of people that ever lived on earth can say? Can a Pope say it? Can a president say it? Can any great leader say it? Can any great warrior say it? I mean, listen, Floyd Mayweather, love him like a brother. Man, this dude got 100 titles, but he can never say he was heavyweight champion of the world, meaning from North Pole to South Pole, I'm the baddest man on the planet. Nobody can say that but a heavyweight champion of the world. So that's what I always wanted, man. Hey, man, well, you deserve it. You did it. You worked hard for it. And I'm glad you did it. And, man, I was, I was just glad to be, you know, in your life and, you know, for us to be down for each other for so long and at our high moments like that, man. Hey, look, you introduced me to Bill. You know? Hey, man, look, I introduced you to Layla, chump. No, you didn't. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to jog your memory. Remember, I didn't want to train with her because I was in the middle of my career. So I said, y'all, hey, man, you know a chick named Layla Ali? I said, hey, man, she <laughs> want me to train. She want me to train with her. But I got to get ready. I only got five fights. And, you know, remember Dub Huntley from Broadway because Dub was trained by Bill yeah, Slayton? So, yeah, that. man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, man. Well, look, man, I just want to thank you for coming on the show, man, taking this time, man. And, uh, yeah, man, you know, like I, I appreciate you allowing me on, man. Um, you know, I, I wish you much success, man. I, I really think that this is definitely something that, that you should have been doing a long time ago because you understand people. And I like the way that you've always been able to have communication with people, all different kind of people, all different colors, all different heights, all different nationalities, man. You're great at what you do in terms of your social skills, man. And brothers like you, you know, you should be in front of the camera. You speak well. I'm surprised you ain't punching. No, I'm just kidding. But no, nah, man, on the real though, man. On the real, I, I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very, I'm very happy for you, man. And I'm gonna do everything I can do to spread the word about this show, man. And it's, it's great to be able to just have a real conversation with a real dude because that makes me feel like, you know, you being a champion, speaking to a champion, it automatically let, it makes me let my guard down. I'm not coming at you from the standpoint, oh, he's a fan. No, you're a champion. And everything I say and everything I do, you can understand that, man. So right. it's great, man. I hope I get to come back. Oh, no doubt, man, for sure, man. I appreciate you, man. Until the next time. Keep your hands up and stay on your feet. Next week, tune in. The next episode of Tuesday Night Fight Talk. Hey, hit the subscribe, tell a friend, and share it. Champ. Gotta stay focused. I will not lose. Uh -huh. I got the mind of a champ. Uh -huh. Undefeated like the champ. Like champ. We're well respected when you see me. You see me. The street treat me like a, like a champ. Got my weight right like the champ. 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 champ.